continuing the discussion on understanding what can constitute as good for the purpose of the application of the Sale of Goods Act of 1930. Uh, also, uh, looking at the cooperative federalism uh, of taxation, where center and state equally would want to tax contracts. Uh, an issue that was quite interesting is to look at these three things. Uh, LPG, that is gas, electricity and water. Can these three be considered as goods? Now, while you see the multiplicity of uh, you know, cases and uh, the kind of, uh, you know, we see the challenges uh, that the courts had to look into the application of these. Uh, then looking at what jurists think that uh, should they be considered as one or not. Uh, you will notice that, you know, while we talk about water, we say water is supplied, electricity is supplied, LPG is delivered, right? Now, with LPG, friends, what happens is it's liquefied gas. It is actually trapped into a, a cylinder and then delivered to you. Now, the cylinder is measured. Right? That is a measurement of 14 kgs and so on and so forth. And then it is delivered to you for which you use the content, not the container. Now, this content versus container is a very interesting uh, philosophy that we have to look into. Uh, and uh, here you will notice that you use the content, but give back the content. Now, that's the interesting part. So, can you say the content which is liquefied gas can be considered as good? You see, the rule is about tangibility, right? Now, can you really feel, uh, can you weigh uh, the kind of uh, commodity or article and then can you consider them that to be good, right? So, LPG is not material uh, in any form, right? So, that's the problem with LPG. Now, coming to electricity, friends, please note, electricity is supplied in terms of the wires and, you know, the cable lines and so on and so forth. But when it is coming into your house, probably there is a meter that measures the consumption. But can you really say it is a commodity? Can you say electricity is an article, right? Now, both, uh, you know, liquefied gas and electricity uh, could be felt in some form, but it's not necessarily tangible in that sense, unlike water, water is tangible. But the problem with water is how do you measure what is being supplied and can that measurability result in it being commodity or an article? Now, commodification of water means privatization in one sense. Commodification of water means private uh, companies want to sell it, buy it and so on and so forth, right? So, we today have seen water being sold in buckets. But water that is supplied to your house, can it be considered as goods? And then can that contract be one of sale of goods, right? And can the sale of goods act apply? That's the first rule. But more importantly, will sales tax apply to such contracts, right? So, I think the majority opinion on this is that uh, these three things can, are considered as goods for multiple reasons that the judges have laid down in different cases. First among them, they said, look, if you look at the Electricity Act of 2003, which is the law that governs uh, the, the uh, production, generation uh, and uh, distribution and transmission of electricity, uh, you know that the Electricity Act of 2003 has established what we know as the Central Electricity Regulatory Commission and the State Electricity Regulatory Commissions. Uh, it governs the business of electricity largely right from its production to its uh, uh, final consumption. Now, there is something called electricity theft under this legislation where uh, you actually steal electricity, uh, maybe through an illegal connection, maybe through uh, tampering of the meter, but that is theft and theft the courts have said can only be of commodity or of goods. And secondly, you know, you can actually feel electricity, which means, you know, it can give you a shock. So that tangibility of electricity is also there. And hence, uh, today, if you apply this kind of a, a analogy of saying that there can be electricity theft, for which we then consider under, say, the Information Technology Act of 2000, uh, what we call as data theft. Then in that sense, data also must be considered as some kind of a material commodity or article, right? So I think the extension of this analogy that is there for these three traditional forms of supply of uh, some kind of service, which is to be considered as goods, can actually be made analogous to uh, the modern uh, 
uh, challenges that we face in terms of the application of the sale of goods act so uh, i think uh, here uh, the courts have said something like this that if there can be deliverability in some form there can be transferability of some form if there can be measurability of some form now you can measure these three things right gas electricity and water what is the consumption can be measured and you can actually look at that measure uh, consumption being transferred to the consumer those are probably some of the reasons that the courts have said that because there is measurability because there is transferability uh, which is the uh, test of deliverability uh, to the consumer uh, these three things can be considered as sale of goods now what is important for us to understand is the primary contention in all these cases uh, was whether state governments which are plenty in number you know we know how many state governments are there in india uh, we have 29 states right now uh, you will notice these are fighting to tax these contracts that by increasing their taxation provision uh, because these are contracts in which sales tax can be imposed because uh, that is what the constitution says that sales tax can be imposed only on sale of goods uh, the contention on the uh, other hand or what is reversed is uh, if they are not sale of goods they could be supply of services and supply of services comes within the domain of the central government who can actually tax this so that was the central theme of the argument however i think the courts did look at the definition of goods and try to understand it not only from the perspective of the constitution which i think uh, is important but also from the point of the application of the sale of goods act 1930. now moving on to another interesting aspect of lottery tickets now there are three cases that unfortunately came uh, into contention uh, the uh, andraj case the Vikas Sale Corporation case, but most importantly, the judgment that is now prevalent is the Sunrise Associates uh, versus Government of Delhi case. This is a fight judgment, so you will notice the importance that these cases have uh, in terms of uh, you know why should we decide uh, one thing against the other. Now, lottery tickets, friends. Uh, the the immediate uh, you know reason why we have to understand is look, it is tangible in one sense, right? Now, is paper commodity? Is paper goods? Is paper article? The answer is yes, it is. Right? Now, if something is printed on the paper, right? Suppose it is photocopy, can I consider that to be goods? Paper is goods, but whether the photocopier who is photocopying and printing it, or say a printer who is printing on a piece of paper, can be it be considered as goods? Now, for example, a book. Now, book is nothing but paper, right? But it's printed paper. It's not, you know, not ordinary paper. Now, can books be considered as goods? The answer is yes, of course it can be. Similarly, you will notice that we had times when these photographs, and this is a very interesting case called the Rainbow Color Labs case, uh, wherein the issue was whether these color labs that are printing photographs, uh, can they be uh, considered to be under the contract of sale of goods, right? Now, Printing was considered to be service. So you, you are just you know putting your labor and skill and you know putting the colors and you are actually printing it on paper. Paper is goods, but what is being printed is not. Was the contention in the Rainbow Color Labs case? Now, when you look at all of these contentions, you will come to this case called the Sunrise Versus Six case, where the question was about lottery tickets. Now, lottery tickets, friends, is just a printed piece of paper. It's nothing but uh, over there. So you buy a lottery ticket. Why do you buy? Because there is a special number to it. And this is the not the online lottery, but uh, the physical lotteries. Uh, and interestingly, in India, you will notice that lotteries is quite, kind of a regulated activity. The constitution permits state governments to uh, permit, you know, allow lotteries, but only if the state government wishes to be involved in it, because it you know kind of naturally encourages gambling. Uh, and lotteries. Uh, uh, are you know floated by the state government for developmental purposes and so on and so forth. Uh, I come from Karnataka right now as I speak. Karnataka government has banned lotteries like many states, but there are states like Sikkim uh, and others who permit lotteries. You have states like Goa who also permit uh, uh, gambling in some form, especially in the form of casinos. So state governments are permitted to regulate the activities of lottery. So lottery business can still exist in that sense. And the question is whether lotteries that are printed just on a piece of paper can be considered as contract of sale of goods. So this question was raised before the judges 
And the judges said, look, lottery contains three things. And that is where the importance comes over here about trying to understand the business and contract and then later on decide whether the sale of goods act applies or not. So understanding the business of lotteries, you will notice that there is a price uh, that is to be won in a lottery, correct? And uh, the price is a chance. It's not confirmed that you will definitely get it, right? It's a chance. Uh, and uh, uh, it's like, you know, you may or you may not. And you actually pay a consideration for the same, right? To, uh, you know, take part in the scheme of the lottery. So just as Roma Paul, uh, you know, said that while you want to look at lotteries in a sense that, look, what do you get in a lottery? Uh, can you transfer the lottery ticket? Maybe yes. But again, you will notice that there are, would be conditions of non-transferability over here. But when you transfer, it is nothing but a chance to participate in the lottery that you have transferred. It's not a commodity or article in itself that it can be traded. It has no value in itself. Now, the only value that lottery ticket has is the winning lottery ticket, in which the number has been announced and the number appears on that lottery ticket. Right? So, except that rest of this uh, you know, uh, thing is just a chance and nothing more than that. So, the question was, if you are trying to look at lottery tickets, uh, can you consider them to be uh, an actionable claim instead of goods? Because we have to now start distinguishing contract and say, if they don't fit within goods, they have to fit probably within actionable claims or within services. So the option of actionable claim is already there in law and hence we are to evaluate whether lottery tickets comes within that uh, uh, or not. Now actionable claim, friends, the term actionable claim, right? It is a piece of paper in which your claim has been settled, your claim has been proclaimed, your claim exists in the eyes of law. So the piece of paper is of no value except for the claim, right? So it's not a commodity or an article or a material which is there off the shelf for everyone to exercise or transfer or get. So that is what an actionable claim actually means and this is defined uh, under the Transfer Property Act 1882 and hence we have to understand uh, what this would mean uh, uh, and lottery tickets interestingly uh, the court said cannot be considered as good because it is just a, a chance for winning a prize for a consideration right. So the piece of chance for winning a prize cannot be commodity, cannot be an article uh, it can maximum be an actionable claim only for the winning lottery and uh, the lottery ticket itself does not have a value of its own. It's merely a piece of paper and nothing more than that. It could be an evidence of uh, the right uh, to win the lottery, uh, but apart from that, it has nothing else. And hence, a uh, lottery ticket can be best considered as actionable claim, not sale of goods is what the Supreme Court uh, judges had to say. Now, if you understand what actionable claims are, it's very important for us to understand the same because we have to know what kind of contract we are entering into and we have to treat them uh, similarly. Uh, suppose you have an insurance policy and that policy uh, is to be, uh, you know, kind of encashed. Uh, please note the insurance policy uh, for encashment can be considered as an actionable claim because based on that you can claim the insurance, right? So actionable, which means it's a confirmed, uh, uh, you know, kind of right that is determined on a piece of paper and uh, you can actually make a claim from that kind of piece of paper. So it's exercising of a right uh, uh, that we say is an actionable claim. Uh, you know, interestingly, we say a judgment or a decree that is made by a court. Now, you know judgments and decrees are put on a paper and that is the judgment or paper on which you can claim your rights. That also can be considered as an actionable claim. Uh, our passbooks with the bank, um, you know, it's an actionable claim because we know exactly with that passbook what is our, uh, you know, account balance. Uh, we can go and withdraw it. Uh, the provident fund uh, passbook can also be an actionable claim. So all of these are considered as actionable claim and that's why you will notice that actionable claims cannot or should not be considered as goods and you don't make these actionable claims as sale of commodity and you don't bring commercial material angle uh, to the same and that's where some of these uh, elements in uh, our society are not uh, amounting to sale of goods. Moving forward friends. Uh, 
very interesting aspect that did come about in this BSNL case, uh, which uh, you know is kind of one of our favorite cases that we discussed in uh, you know law classes, is about uh, telecommunication. Now, telecommunication business has flourished in India, and obviously there are numerous transactions and contracts that have been made. And uh, once a sector starts, uh, you know, making a lot of noise, a lot of money, a lot of contract, obviously the state government or any other government would want to tax the same. So interestingly, in India, we had landline connection. Even now we do, do have, but mobile has actually taken over uh, the telecommunication business. Now, when we had landline connection, you would notice that we had a kind of, uh, you know, something like this, right? So we had... Uh, an instrument uh, through which uh, we would receive the calls and we would make calls uh, and today we have what is known as a mobile phone which is also an instrument that receives uh, these calls but a landline is kind of fixed because there is a wire whereas telecommunication on the phone is through electromagnetic waves the towers actually uh, disseminate those kinds of signals so there is some kind of a distinction in the kind of business that is made Secondly, you will notice that once there is a wire to this uh, phone, uh, which is the instrument for a landline connection, uh, you know, there is nothing, you know, you, you can make calls. So the wire connects you to different people across uh, networks. But here, unfortunately, there is a SIM card, uh, which is considered as the activation device to actually receive the electromagnetic waves from the mobile service companies. So the question before the court was, can the business of telecommunication be considered as sale of goods? And most importantly, can the electromagnetic waves that are transferred in terms of talk time, uh, you get 2 GB data, you get so many talk times, can they also be considered as goods? And finally, can SIM cards also be considered as goods? So all of these issues was brought before the court uh, because, of course, if they are goods, they become sale. If they are sale, they become uh, applicable to sale tax. Now, I think, you know, courts were considering the whole aspect of, you know, the business, the contract, and the intention of parties. I think these three are very relevant and important. And then looking at the need of the state governments to impose sales tax. So I think all of these three were important considerations for the court to actually evaluate uh, whether uh, such contracts should be taxed uh, under Sale of Goods Act or not. So the court held that look, electromagnetic waves were neither abstracted nor were they consumed in the sense uh, that they were extinguished by their users. So it's not uh, something that is delivered, right? Uh, it is not stored or processed. It is only something that is uh, supplied. Uh, and hence, uh, the SIM card is merely an activation device. Uh, the SIM card does not have a sale of its own. It's not mercantile uh, of its own, right? Though it could be tangible, it's just an activation device. So, what does the SIM card do? Look, in many cases, you will notice that the hardware is just trying to support the software, and the hardware is just a small component, and software is basically the service that is supplied to activate uh, within the hardware device. So, the SIM card has no uh, separate value. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, saleability unless it is given as a valid SIM card by the service companies that are actually giving you uh, mobile telecommunication services. So I think the courts in the BSNL judgment very clearly said that the dominant nature of this contract, right, the maximum, what does this contract maximum do? Does it do service or does it do goods? Right? So I think the dominant nature contract is very, very important and they concluded that electromagnetic waves are not goods within the definition of the constitution of India. The equipments are definitely, the handset is considered as goods. And finally, coming to the activation device, they said uh, the activation device can be accessed separately if you require, but it's the question is whether it is divided between the electromagnetic waves that is service and the activation device, right? So, uh, hence, uh, the court said that the SIM cards cannot be taxed. Uh, we cannot consider them to be sale of goods. Uh, it's only an activation device. So, you cannot really divide SIM card vis-a-vis -vis the electromagnetic waves. They are combined together. And hence, unless there is a divisibility test, you cannot separate the two and you cannot tax them differently. Now, why we all have now understood 
the nature of the judgment in the BSNF case, you must be considering now how is this relevant to government contracts. The discussion so far. Friends, the discussion so far uh, is important not only to understand what nature of contract you are implementing because you have to draft your purchase orders, your agreements, you have to understand uh, whether it is goods, whether it is sale. But it's more important that every contract that is made must have proper applicable taxes. And hence you must know the nature of the contract to actually impose the proper taxation. Now, if we do not import proper taxation, then uh, that would not make the contract actually uh, uh, a valid enforceable one. Because uh, enforceable contract is a contract which is appropriately taxed and there is no tax uh, avoidance uh, by any circumstances. Uh, and you have to make a contract uh, as per the law of the land. Now, at this point of time, I think while we are speaking of common contracts, while we are speaking about sale of goods, it's very pertinent to uh, know a very interesting case of uh, uh, cone elevators. Cone elevators. Now, cone elevators actually took part in a government tendering contract. Right? Now, elevators, friends, the question was an elevator is it goods or service? Now, everything in the elevator is tangible, right? It's material. However, elevators are not something that are available off the shelf. It, they are not something that you can uh, just go and buy, right? They have to be customized. They have to be made to order. Uh, they have to be measured, capacity, everything. And then it has to be brought about and uh, uh, commissioned or installed in a particular place. So, cone. Uh, you know, they considered that this is, uh, you know, this is a contract, so they took part in the tender and they quoted a price. Now, when you quote a price, very importantly, should tender say with all the applicable taxes? Most tenders should evaluate the bid amount or the price bid or the financial bid uh, with all applicable taxes, right? We say it is the landing cost. You can only evaluate L1 based on the landing cost. This includes the cost of transport, uh, cost of packaging and the taxation. Uh, it could be customs duty, it could be import duty or any other duty for that matter. But we say it is based on the landing cost. That's how you evaluate L1. Now suppose, uh, uh, you know, so what happened in this case was coal elevators. Uh, they said, look, uh, we think it is a service. Right. So at that point of time, the service tax was quite high and uh, it was in the range of, I think, 11 to 14 percent. Uh, you will notice they said, look, we will, uh, you know, uh, uh, quote with service tax. Now, when they quoted with service tax, their you know, base price plus service tax, they became yield 2 Now, L1, uh, when he quoted, he quoted sales tax. Now, sales tax was in the range of less than 5% in many of the states and sales tax made the contract cheaper because remember 14% is higher tax and 5% is lower tax. So, they said that it is sale of goods, right? And uh, uh, the applicable tax to our contract is just 5% and uh, they became a one, right? Cole challenged this in the court of law and they said that there is a deliberate tax uh, avoidance uh, and evasion by treating this contract of a sale of goods because this is not a sale of goods contract rather it is a supply of service contract for which service tax should be applied. So this kind of mischief uh, by judging contracts as being service as against goods uh, will result in inequity, uh, will result in wrong choices of L1 and this would actually give a public policy dimension to challenge government contracts as well. So these are possible reasons why we must understand which are the contracts that are goods contract and which are the contracts that are service contract so that appropriate taxation will result in appropriate evaluation of the bidders and the bid and thereby going to award the contracts as well. So just to give you a sense of why these cases are very relevant, important and how contracts and taxation are very interestingly brought together uh, uh, in the discussion here.